So today we're going to look at rather a technical subject, but a useful one, which is about clustering pyro and smoke simulations. So let me just demonstrate, first of all, a very simple clustering setup. So I've got some terrain here, and I've selected some polygons on that terrain, and then I'm just scattering some points on these polygons, and we're going to have flames leap up from, from these points. And obviously we could do that by having a big box which encloses all of the points, but it's much more efficient if we have smaller boxes over each of the points, and that's uh, what you use clustering for. So in fact, there's a shelf tool which can set this up automatically for you, and it's the pyro cluster tool up here. So I want to make sure my points are visible, and the pyro cluster tool expects there to be points on which you're going to which are going to create the fuel for your flames. So if I select the shelf tool, uh, it should create some boxes, and these boxes are representing uh, the boxes that will be used for the simulation. Now you see at the moment uh, we've got more boxes than we have fuel sources. Uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, six fuel sources, but you can see here in some cases these are split up into into different boxes, which may be what you want, uh, but perhaps you just want a single box per simulation, per set of points, and you can do that. Uh, it's The shelf tool has created a pyro simulation, and it's created this node here called source points source points uh, source points because that's what I had originally called these points if I dive inside here there's quite a complicated network we can perhaps explain it a bit later on uh, but the key thing here is this cluster points node and that's the thing that's splitting those points up into different groups if you like and as you can see on this it has a parameter called clusters at the moment it's creating 10 clusters, which is why some of those points are divided into two boxes. Since I know I've got six lots of points, if I set this to six, uh, what we should see is that each set of points now has its own box. Okay, well let's see what happens when we run a simulation on that. Um, so I'll go into the pyro sim so we can see it. And I'll press play. And we can see we get flames leaping up and pretty quickly they're reaching uh, the, the top of those boxes. So we've reached the height limit for those boxes. And that's because it's just setting up a default size for each simulation box, and it's doing that by looking at the size of the points that are going in, how, how wide the area the points cover. So you're going to often need to change the dimensions of these boxes, and you can do that in this node that was created by the shelf, uh, the source points node, and we go back onto this cluster points node here, and in the second part of it, uh, there's something called averaging settings, and the averaging settings include a scale attribute, and that's what the pyro simulation is using to decide the maximum size of each of those boxes. So there are two components: there's the padding at one corner down here, and the padding at one corner down here. So for the upper corner, I'm going to add a lot of height, and then I'm going to make these to the left and the right uh, 0.25, just to give us a bit more space. Uh, this one we can leave as it is, because the, the flames are not going to travel downwards. So if we go back into our pyro simulation, and rewind, we can now see that the boxes uh, are much higher, so that when the flames go up, uh, you're getting a bit more space for the flames to occupy. Now, of course, uh, this is still probably too, too big a flame, uh, and you can affect the size of the flame in the parameters for your pyro solver. So the pyro solver with flames works on the combustion model. One of the key things you can do is turn down the amount of gas released and you can reduce the flame height and the other thing you can do is to reduce the fuel inefficiency to zero that means all the fuel is going to get burned at every frame and if necessary you can reduce the amount of fuel coming in at each frame uh, you'll see there's this source fuel from source points and down here there's a multiplier. The fuel is coming in, it's being added at each frame. 
but you can multiply this so you could say only half of it's going to come in so now we can look and see what that looks like and you can see it's it's growing much more slowly in fact it's yeah that may be a bit more what you would like of course this is a very low resolution sim in real life you would want to increase the resolution by changing these uh, division size, the division size here on the smoke object. So that's the very basic clustering situation. Uh, let's look at a, a more interesting example where we're setting up a simulation where the fire is spreading across a shape. So for this more complicated example we're going to use this shape here uh, which I've remeshed to make sure it has plenty of points and what I've done first of all is create a group which you probably can't see but it's some points down here and then I'm creating an attribute called active and active is going to determine whether or not a part of the shape has yet appeared and is yet creating flames so over time this shape is going to grow and, and gradually appear as you will see in a moment so this is creating an attribute called active um, and for the group that I've set up, initial, it's going to have the value 1, but everywhere else it's going to have the value 0. So for these points down here, it's got the value 1 initially. And then I'm creating another group, uh, which is all these points in the middle here, and I'm creating uh, an attribute which is called weight, and for that group in the middle, the value of weight is 0 0.1, and everywhere else it's 1. And the value of weight is going to be used a little bit later on so you'll see how it works and then finally I'm creating an attribute called start frame giving it a value of minus one so now we're going to create the spreading effect before we go into the pyro simulation so let's lay down a geometry node and I'm just going to call this spreading and lay down an object merge and just pick up uh, the results of that shape there and a second for some reason that's off screen uh, so we need initial shape out okay and now the next thing we need is a solver and the reason we need a solver is because the spreading is going to change attributes on this shape at every frame and it's going to do it based on the last frame so we're going to need a solver because that feeds things back into a loop uh, in the old days you would have had to set up a dot network and create a SOP solver. I did a video on that with a match with the fire spreading along it. These days it's much easier. You can just use the solver node here directly in SOPs. So let's dive inside. And what we're going to do is we're going to use uh, a node which appeared a few versions of Houdini ago called attribute blur and attribute blur allows you to blur an attribute on your geometry and in our case it's going to be that attribute that we called active okay and then let's visualize that up here oops uh, let's put a visualizer down and let's visualize active and it's a point right that seems to be working all right let me do it as a ramped tribute right we can see that where it's red uh, active is 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 one has a value of one and then where it's blue has a value of zero as we go through this we can see it's not really spreading it's it's blurring out um, and the reason it's not really working as we want is because at each frame these initial values which are one are getting blurred out so they're getting less than one and then less than one again and it goes down and down and down so we need to reinforce these values at each frame as well so we need uh, an attribute wrangle and we can use at active which is means this attribute uh, that we've got in our points and I'm going to times equal 1.1 so that's active is active times 1.1 so it's growing by 10% at every frame uh, 
But we want to make sure it never gets um, bigger than one. So active equals clamp active naught comma one. So I think I've got the arrangement of that clamp function right. So if we've got this right, what we should now see is that it's spreading out like this. Okay. So far, so good. So we've got a couple of problems with this, as you can see. Um, it's not really going to the edges, and the second is even over 240 frames, it's not covering the whole H shape. Let's go back in here. Um, so the attribute blur has uh, this option here called pin border points, and that's what's causing the border not to change. So if I now unpin that, what we should see is that is now covering the border, but it's still not going all the way across the H. And what we can do is we can do more than one iteration per frame. So let's try going up to three iterations. And what this should mean is it should blur more quickly. Yep. There we go. So it's now getting to the end at frame 201. So perhaps I want to control a bit more carefully how this blurring has happened, how this attribute is spreading. So for example, I might want it to get to the top of here before it starts spreading over here. And you can do that by using the weight attribute that we created earlier. And if you remember, we set the weight here and here to 1, and then in the middle here, we set it to 0 0.1. And on the attribute blur node, uh, we can in fact uh, add a weight attribute there. You can use any attribute you like. We've called it weight. And it will take, it will take this into account when it decides how to uh, blur. So what we should see now, if we go up, is that it will go across here. And then it's spreading much more slowly over here. So this is getting to the top of there before that's reached uh, the end and then carries on. Trouble is now it's not getting across the whole thing. So let's go back into here. And let's say increase this up to six. And let's try again. Yeah, that's actually finally getting to the end there. Okay, so let's now sort out the fuel for our pyro simulation. And we could, um, th this shelf tool won't work now because we've got a, uh, a situation where the fuel is changing at each frame. Uh, the, the, the extent of this is changing at each frame. This is for things where the, the source of fuel is, is static. We could use this shelf tool here called smoke trail but that produces smoke rather than, than pyro. So we're going to actually set this up by hand and that will help us understand how it works, I hope. So let's lay down a geonode and let's call this um, source fuel. Okay, and then we're going to import the The spreading and then we're going to do a blast and we're going to blast active is greater than 0 0.5 and we're going to delete non-selected uh, and we're going to delete points there we go so we should get as this there we go we get, get this growing so the next thing I'm going to do is scatter some points on this, which we're going to use to create fuel. So let me do a scatter, like so. And what we want to do is uh, count per primitive, because otherwise we'll get less and less. Um, I don't need an attribute. Uh, I'm just going to put in, say, 100 per primitive. And then what we should see is this, we get more and more points as this expands. In fact, uh, 100 per primitive is probably too many. We're probably getting a very great many points here. In fact, we are. 
There we are, we've got 200,000 points, which we certainly don't need. So let's take that down to five per primitive. There we go, that's a bit more like it. Okay, so those are going to be the points for our simulation, uh, for the fuel for the simulation. If we go to the end there, we can see the whole thing is covered with points. If we have used um, the original option up here, which is by density, and um, we'd say start with a thousand, you'd have a lot of points at the beginning, but then towards the end they'd all be spread out, you wouldn't have enough points. So that's why we're using count per primitive. So how are we going to get the clustering to work in this situation uh, where the number of points is, is changing at each frame? Well the answer is that you have to start at the end. So I'm going to do a time shift like so and I'm going to set this to dollar RF end, which is the last frame, so that's going to evaluate to 240. So that's going to give us this final set of points, and I'm going to use a cluster points, which is what we saw earlier on, and I can leave it at 10, 10 frames. Now, in order for clustering to work, we're going to need these points to have a cluster number, and we're also going to need to know the center of each set of points. Unfortunately, this cluster points node can give us both. So here there's a set of choices of outputs. We can have the cluster points, which is what we're seeing at the moment, or we can have the average points, which is the centers, or both. And we need both. So the other thing we're going to need to know is what frame each of these points appears, as it were. And that's why we have that start frame attribute set up here, which by default is minus one. So let's go back into our spreading and into our solver. And let me rename this so because we're going to have another attribute wrangle. Let's rename this enhance active. And then let's lay down another attribute wrangle. And this is going to set the start frame. So we know uh, that if the start frame is less than zero, then the particle hasn't had a start frame set. And we know that if active is greater than 0 0.5, then it's in that set of particles that will appear, that won't, that won't be deleted. So the combination of those two things tells you that this is a, this is a particle or a point uh, that is going to appear on this frame. And so we can set start frame equals to frame, like so. And that's errored out because I haven't put an at in there. So what this should do is ensure that each of these points gets a start frame assigned to it. So what I've done now is just very quickly add a visualizer jumped back out of the solver, added a visualizer, which is visualizing the start frame. And we can see at the beginning, uh, absolutely everything has a value of minus one. But then as we play through, uh, we can see that, you know, these have, that has frame 10, 12, 26, and so on. So as it goes through, it's assigning a frame, correct frame for each uh, start frame. So let's turn that, that visualizer off. And what we now need to do is, for each cluster, we need to find out the minimum start frame. And the reason we need to do that is because as soon as one of these points has appeared that's in that cluster, the box for that pyro simulation needs to appear. It can't wait until we get to the middle here. It has to be the first one. So there are various ways we can do that. What I'm going to do, first of all, is blast away. Remember, we've got two different types of point coming out of this cluster points one of which is our average points, and the other one is our cluster points. The average points are the center points of each cluster. So let's get rid of uh, the average points for the moment. Okay, and now I want to find out of those points here, which ones are the ones that are, um, what's the, the lowest start frame for each of those? So I can do this using a for each, for each point in this case, and 
what I want to do is use a piece attribute and I'm going to use the integer attribute cluster. Now this, this is set up by this cluster points node. It gives each point a cluster attribute as you can see here and we're going to go through each of those in turn. That, that's what you see visualized. Whoopsie daisy. Uh, that's what you see visualized here. These are each each cluster is a different color. And we need to find out the, the minimum start frame on each. And we can do that using a trick using attribute promote. So we start off with an attribute promote here. Uh, and we're going to promote the start frame attribute. And we're going to promote it from point to detail. And a detail attribute has a single value for each set of points. In fact, let me let me make this easier to understand by just looking at a single pass to start with. So it's just going to be those points. And we're going to find the minimum start frame for those. So we look at start frame, we promote it from point to detail. Detail means there's a single value for all of those. But instead of average, we get the minimum. And then we need to promote it back down again, because otherwise it'll get erased as we go through each iteration and we start with a detail attribute and it's going to be start train and we, we're going to put it on the points like so so we should now find there we are start frame is one if we move this up say to two three each of these has a different start frame okay good so where we really need those start frames is on the average points, that is the center points. So let me control C, control V to get a copy of this blast. And instead of deleting that group, we're going to keep it and delete everything else. We can see we just have a single point, one for each cluster. And I need to do an attribute transfer. We're going to transfer uh, two these points and we're going to transfer from those points and the attribute we're going to transfer is the point attribute start frame and at the moment that's all showing one because I've still got this set to a single pass so when I do that now we should see yep that that is now correct so I need to make sure that these are integers. First of all, let me rename this. So let's do uh, an attribute wrangle. And let's do at start frame equals floor. Like so. Now we've got a problem here. This this one is for some reason starts off with a value of one, but then the floor is giving it a value of zero. That shouldn't be uh, the case. Um, so we're going to have to correct that. So So that makes sure that the start frame is always at least one. Don't know what's going on there. There's a there's a mathematical error in this version of Houdini or something. So what we actually want to do um, is create a group called keep. And we want to put in it the points uh, whose start frame is equal to the current frame. So at start frame equals at frame and for good measure let's put a floor around this as well and what we should find if we're at frame one is that there should be one point in there you probably couldn't see that but there is and therefore we
we blast and we blast keep and we delete unselected so that gives us just the point that is here so what we should see is that exists for one frame then disappears then various points appear as we go through why do we need that uh, because the pyro simulation works by looking at the points that we're going to feed into it and whenever a point appears just for a single frame it creates that box if the point appears again in the next frame it'll create another box you get two which we don't want we just want a single one so we need this just to appear for a single frame which is what we're doing here so let's add something to the end of this let's add a null and let's call it centers out right and that's going to be the points that we're going to use for instancing when we get to our pyro simulation the other thing we're going to need is some fuel so let's uh, do that over here um, let's do it in the same let's do it in the same whoops let's do it in the same network so uh, what we need to do first of all is set up the sourcing for fuel and I'm going to do that using the shelf tool to start with uh, let's uh, find that and to start to do that I need to set up a dummy container to start with so let me set up uh, where are we? A pyro container. Let's just give it a default. And then let me go back into our fuel and let me go back to populate containers and source from points like so. And then we are going to select the source fuel. I'm going to press enter. And then we're going to select the pyro that we just created, like so. OK. And we're going to need to divide this up so that each separate box, each cluster, has its own fuel and temperature and so on. It, it's not going to work by having a single sourcing like this. It needs to have a separate one for each cluster. So the first thing we're going to need to do is make sure that we are getting this from the original points. So because it's going to grow over each frame, that's what's coming in here after the scatter. We want it before the time shift. So that's going to grow like that. OK. The next thing we're going to need to do is to get the cluster attribute. So how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to use an attribute transfer. And we're going to transfer onto these points. And we're going to transfer from the points that have the cluster attribute, these ones. And the thing we're going to transfer from is cluster okay so now each of these points should have a cluster value at the moment because we're at frame uh, one i think the cluster value is going to be zero for all of them if we go right up to here then you can see they have they have different cluster values okay so now we're going to need to do a for each again same as we did before for each point let me rename this cluster and we're going to loop through each cluster and we're going to set up all of this 
So these nodes are going to go in here. Apart from that one, that one is going to go there. That one is going to connect into there. So this is going to create our fields for each of our cluster groups. And then finally, we need to use a name, SOP, to give each of these a number at the end. OK. And in fact, I don't probably want to use a name node. I probably want to use an attribute wrangle. And I want to rename the things. And I've, I've actually copied this so I know what it is. And I'm going to paste it in here. So this is going to give us the name. is going to be the concat, that is adding together the existing name plus an underline plus converting a string into, uh, sorry, an integer into a string, and we're getting the input one and giving it the value. And at the moment we don't have an input one, and we need to create the meta import node and then feed it in. Let's do that again. That needs to go into input one. So what's going on here? So the meta import node has some detail attributes on it, which tell you as you go around this loop, uh, these will change the iteration number, the value, that's the value of the cluster attribute, the number of iterations, and the maximum number of iterations. So in this case, uh, it's going to give it a name, which is the original name plus this value that it's getting from here, which is the current value of this. So what we end up getting is, should be, yeah, different fuel and temperature. It's not working as it should because it's running over points and it should run over primitives. And that should now give us, yeah, different names for each. The in fact, to be a little bit more efficient, uh, we can take those two out of there and we can put them earlier on in the chain because we don't need them to happen on each. They don't depend on the cluster. So why are they failing? Let me just have a look. No, they're fine. OK. So that should be producing a separate volume for each cluster. So that's been rather a long explanation, uh, but we now have everything we need to set up the pyro simulation. So let's go into our pyro simulation and make sure we're at frame one, otherwise we'll start calculating it all. We'll lay it out. And what we want to do is change some parameters here on the pyro object. and what we want to do is turn on instancing. So create objects from points, and then we need to point it at the centers out. So these are the, the centers that we had earlier, and we want continuous set on. This is the difference between the static. You remember each point just starts at the beginning and carries on. That's what we had before. In this case, each point is different. Uh, happening at a different time, so we need continuous, and that'll mean if we have a look here, that what we should see, obviously these are these are too small, but you can see that they're the boxes are too small, but you can see they're appearing at the right point. Again, in order to fix that size of the box, we can go into our cluster node here and we can increase the size. So let's give it 5, let's give this 0.25, 5, so that should mean now if we go back to the pyro simulation we're getting a much more realistic box size. Again the, the flame is far too high but uh, 
you get the idea. And that's going to spread across. I'll play it through so we can see. With each frame, the cluster is going to appear and give us the right number of clustered boxes for our simulation as the frame increases like so. Obviously this simulation is, is far too strong for the size of the boxes but it should be working. It's running into a problem there So sometimes it can run into problems because the box is resized down to nothing before it gets the chance to have any fuel. So let's delay the resizing by a couple of frames. And I'm going to pause the video and play through this again. So that seems to have solved the problem. I think what was happening is that uh, sometimes there isn't enough fuel in the box when it, when it first uh, appears, or density in this case. And so it shrinks down to nothing and then it misses the fuel later on. So by delaying the frames a little bit so that it stays at its maximum size for a couple of frames and then downsizes, you can help solve that problem. And that seems to have fixed it. And we can see here that our boxes are appearing and the simulation is going as we would expect. So let me just render, pick a random frame and just render this out. Create a camera. And let me go onto the render view. And let's render that out. And I'm doing this because there's an issue that you can sometimes get with the pyro simulations, uh, which I don't think we're going to be able to see here because it's too too strong. Let me just uh, pause the video and fix the, the shape. So I've toned down uh, the values for temperature emission and density on the shader in order to show you a problem that you can get using clustered simulations. And the problem is that where you have two boxes overlapping, uh, the smoke density gets added together. So if you have a low smoke density or a low, if you're rendering with a low density, then sometimes you can see those areas where the boxes are overlapping, you get these artifacts at the boundaries of the boxes. If you're facing that, um, there is something you can do about it. And we need to do that here in the Pyro import node. So here we are in the Pyro import node, and these are the fields that are going to be rendered. And the first thing I need to do is convert them into VDBs, which we can do using convert VDB, put the output to VDB, and we can see now there are 35 VDBs. And next we need to combine some of the fields together, and we can do that using a VDB combine. And let me turn to this view. So we need to combine we need to do something called flatten A groups. And that is going to flatten things that we put up here with this, that are part of the same group. It will flatten into a single VDB. So let's start off with doing that for density. OK. And now if we, what we should find is that there's now a single, let me do a blast. we get a single node for density, a single box. We need to make sure that it encompasses all of them. 
that's because we are copying A, what we need to do is the maximum right. Now it's working. So now what we have is a single box combining all of the earlier boxes but with the maximum of the smoke or density in each box instead of adding them together. And let me get rid of this. And we can do the same for heat and we can do the same for temperature. And now we should see that the single I may not be able to see all this a single set of thirty five different ones, we've got a single one for each of those. And if we look at the render view and we re render, we should see some of this problem of overlapping. How we've moved the camera up. So it's reduced. The, the problem we've got here is that the boxes are actually full of smoke, and therefore we're getting uh, we're getting the, the the edges of the boxes showing up. But let's just showing you two different ones. You can see this is before we've done that calculation. We can see we get much sharper corners to the boxes than when we've done the VDB combine, where the box edges are much blurrier. So that helps to sort out this problem of overlapping boxes. So that's uh, the end of this tutorial on how to do clustering. Uh, the shelf tool that we didn't look at up here, uh, which is the smoke trail, if you lay down one of those and have a look inside, you will see that it works in a very similar way to the setup we made manually here this one and it works when you've got a moving object such as a, a spacecraft with a jet of smoke coming out of the back and it produces smoke and doesn't produce pyro so uh, you can use it to produce pyro but you need to mess around with the settings quite heavily so it's better just to use it for smoke anyway I hope you now get an idea of how clustering works inside Houdini <laughs>